So what Josh and I propose in this paper is that one of the things evolution does is not just change the hardware, but it also provides new observers and new capabilities that extract more benefit from the exact same piece of uh, uh, hardware uh, activity by viewing them in different ways. It's the perspective that can change. So, so you don't change the machine, you add different ways to interpret what that machine is doing and, and, and thereby benefit and get, and get uh, you know, adaptive, uh, in, increases in adaptive fitness. So this is, an, and, and I have some other biological examples if, if you want them, but that's the idea. The idea of polycomputing is that there, any, any set of events could be doing, could be said to be doing many different computational things at the same time, depending on who's observing them and how do they interpret what's going on. And of course, Josh's Josh's example uh, examples um, are are also very powerful in uh, in non living media. So th so this is this is the idea, right? Is that is that you change your perspective? You can you can improve what's going on by you, you, you know not not to not to sound like some kind of um you know uh, a self help uh, kind of thing, but but yeah. but literally literally right in the system, the improvement comes from changing your perspective on things. Not by changing events; it comes from changing the way you look at those events. And so that that leads to a view of of evolution. And, and biology in general as this multi-scale soup of agents interpreting each other and finding better and better ways to interpret each other and understand each other and extract utility from that. And then of course, the better you understand some system, the better you get at hacking it. So 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 that's the vision here, right? Is that is that it's it's just full of it's a it's a huge you know microcosm of observers interpreting each other and finding new new and better ways to decode and interpret what they're getting from their neighbors, from, from the level above, the level below, and so on. Mike, thanks for coming on for round two. Of course. Yeah, good to see you again. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to see you. And uh, to start, I just want to say the response to our first video has been incredible. Our first interview awesome. um, it was only a month ago, but it's already got over 60,000 views in that time, which is super, amazing. Super. Yeah, it's super. Uh, in a short time, it's my most popular interview. So thank you. It's uh, it's incredible. It really resonated with people. Mm. And I think uh, what people, one of the things people really enjoyed in some comments um, on the video were that they hadn't, uh, people that were familiar with their work hadn't seen the computational boundary of a self um, work that you'd done. Mm. Uh, of course, with the great visualization with the cognitive light cones, that was, uh, I think, a lot of people's first introduction to that aspect of your work because you you do touch on so many different so many different areas. So I just want to thank you again for that. It was a great discussion, and can't wait to continue it today. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me on. It's always great fun to talk about that stuff. So yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, today I think just to lay out for the audience what we're going to cover is we're going to start off with uh, it's going to be a three part discussion. I think we're going to start off with. Uh, poly computing and a paper that you wrote with, oh, I'm forgetting the name now, but uh, Joshua Bongard. Josh Bongard, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that paper a little bit. We're going to do a little bit of screen sharing as well. So if folks liked the, a lot of the visuals that we included last time, I think they're going to like that again. And then uh, after that uh, discussion, we're going to go on to the TAME paper, the technological approach to mind everywhere, which is um, essentially a second part to the, the first part that we covered. Uh, and then finally, we're going to follow up. Uh, part three will be ethics, AI, and possibly biomedicine in the future. Great. So that's what we'll cover. But before we dive in, one thing, I, I just before we dive into the main topic of conversation, uh, my favorite comment from our round one came from, if I may, just sort of a request or a comment from uh, Laura Kelly. She asked, um, I would like to hear him play those bongos e djembe in the ah. corner. So... <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, she's going to be disappointed. I, I do not play any of those things uh, well. Uh, what what it is is uh, w when my kids were slightly younger, they would come in here and we would sort of run around and make noise together. Uh -huh. And so uh, it's not like I know how to play these things. I, I sort of, you know, I would bang on them and the kids would bang on them and we would just, you know, we would just they, and they would bring in other things that make noise and we would just do that. So I'm, I am no no kind of a proper bongo player of, of any kind. Oh, darn. Okay. I was hoping for a little Michael Levin unplugged segment we could get yeah, you going. Yeah, I wish. I wish. I mean, you know, at some point my kid might barge in here and then we'll do it, but but it's not going right. to be, it's not, it's not going to be uh, any, any kind of good music. I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Got it. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I'm also musically challenged. I wish, I wish I had that ability, but uh, I just yeah. don't have it. 
So great. All right, let's jump into then polycomputing and the main paper we're going to be discuss, discussing, and I might screen share a little bit in a moment, but uh, it's called There's Plenty of Room Right Here, Biological Systems as Evolved, Overloaded, Multi-Scale Machines. You wrote this paper with Joshua Bungard. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, before I touched this paper, I had no conception of polycomputing at all. So I think it'd be awesome for the audience if, um, can you explain what polycomputing is and how it differs from what we consider, what we generally think of as traditional computing? Sure. Um, and so and so I should say this this work was all 50-50 uh, developed with Josh Bongard. Mm -hmm. Josh, of course, is a professor at University of Vermont. Um, he and I are partners in a lot of different things, including uh, all of the, the Xenobot work. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we, yeah, I think I think the reason you wouldn't have seen it is, to, to my knowledge, that we, we this is a term that we sort of coined and, and, and mm -hmm. used for the first time. So the, the idea is this. Um, in, and this crops up again. This will crop up again and again when we talk about the uh, the tame uh, framework and all of that. It, it, and it has to do with the primacy of observers and uh, kind of an observer centered view of things. So so you can you can start thinking about it this way. Um, what what is a computation? What do we mean when we say something is a computation? And in particular, one it, we we've had we've I, I've been at conferences where we spent days arguing about what that is, and some people say everything is a computation, and I, I even there was even one person who said that nothing is a computation. And he was a <laughs> professor of computer science. I thought that was amazing. Uh, interesting. Um, and so yeah, and so uh, so there's all kinds of views, but but one of the one of the real real um, kind of issues here is that there's this there's this general feeling that there is a truth of the matter about it. So 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 in other words something either is or isn't a computation and one, and and the idea is that we could come up with a definition and then things would either meet that definition or not and then we would know this particular thing you know the trees waving in the wind are they computing there would be some definition that would say yes they are or no they're not and that would be that um and uh the part of the and this this belongs squarely uh, in line with the team framework um the 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 part of this that we're going to change is this idea that there is one unique answer to this question, and what we're going to say is that it is actually uh, dependent on some external observer who views a set of physical events as a computation and benefits thereby. So the idea is that the computation is really in the mind of the observer or or, or multiple observers more than it is a feature of some particular you know set set of a set of physical events. And so on the one hand, it makes things quite relative because it means that there could be multiple observers that look at the exact same set of uh, physical interactions, see different things being computed, interpret them in different ways. And Josh actually and his student Atusa have, have some absolutely beautiful um, published work on this, looking at the, the exact same set of uh, the, the exact same piece of physics and seeing multiple different computations in it. So this is this is actually, you know, there's actually research on this now. Um, but so so it is relative in that sense because multiple observers could disagree about what the computation is here but it isn't anything goes because there's a there's a clear it's not that anything you might say about it is equally valid as anything else it's not that because in treating it as a computation you have to say what does it enable you to do that you couldn't do otherwise? In other words, you have to benefit from that lens of looking at this set of, if you're gonna treat a set of, of um, events as some kind of computation, you have to be able to say, what is the practical import? How did you, how did you benefit by having that? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, title, the title of the paper uh, is how we get into the biology of this, which is that you know, uh, Feynman had this very, very famous uh, work talking about there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he was saying is that we build machines at certain scales, but underneath that at the nanoscale, there's all this room for novel robotics and uh, novel you, you know, new, new engineering that we're not using yet. There's plenty of room down there. Yeah. Well, the thing is in biology, that's not the case because every scale is occupied. There, if you if you look at a cell, there isn't room anywhere because at every scale, from the from the let's say uh, organism level down, anywhere you look, biology is already using it. It's already doing stuff at that scale, all the way down to the you know submolecular interactions. So that so that brings up an interesting question for 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 biological evolution. If if you were trying to add new functionality to a system, where would you put it? Because there isn't new room for it, and specifically. If you start making changes, let's say mutations, one of the problems is that 
you had a pretty well orchestrated system before you start making changes yes maybe some new something new will appear but you're going to wreck all your prior gains right all the subsystems that depend on a given system to work in a certain way you can't just you can't just randomly make changes to it because everything else will fall apart so that so that brings up an important puzzle it's like how 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 would evolution provide new functionality and so what josh and i propose in this paper is that one of the things evolution does is uh, not just change the hardware, but it also provides new observers and new capabilities that extract more benefit from the exact same piece of uh, uh, hardware uh, activity by viewing them in different ways. It's the perspective that can change. So, so you don't change the machine, you add different ways to interpret what that machine is doing and, and, and thereby benefit and get, and get uh, you know, adaptive uh, in, increases in adaptive fitness. So this is, an, and, and I have some other biological examples if, if you want them, but that's the idea. The idea of polycomputing is that there, any, any set of events could be doing, could be said to be doing many different computational things at the same time, depending on who's observing them and how do they interpret what's going on. That's fascinating. The, um, what is the history of this idea or this concept? I mean, is this, um, is this like just a discovery that the two of you made or does this go back in history? Like when was the earliest that we, we knew that biological systems are you know, capable of performing this? Well, um, that depends. Uh, you know, this idea that uh, the idea that uh, there are multiple different ways to interpret events in the organism is quite old. Um, that, that, that idea has been sort of suggested by, by many different traditions. Um, and of course, people have been wrestling with this question of what exactly is a computation for a really long time. But I think this particular fusion of it and the, um, the insistence on an observer point of view when, when understanding these biological and computational things, I, I, think, I, think, that's, I think that's new, um, that, that emphasis of it. And it also it also connects to a very old debate, which has to do with uh, it has to do with 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 reductionism and causal power um, um, in systems. So so let's just think about it this way. Imagine um, a, 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 a traditional physicist looks at a microprocessor doing its thing. You know, it's and 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 so the physicist looks at it, and and, and if that if if that physicist is a reductionist. Um, what he will say is, what, 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 what computer, what algorithm? Uh, no, no, uh, there, there are electrons. There are electrons moving around. None mm -hmm. of the electrons disobey Maxwell's equations and then you know Schrodinger's equations, whatever else is going on at the micro scale. We have we have good equations that describe what the um, what the electrons are doing. That's it. Anything else you put on top of that is 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 fiction. So, so the important the important stuff is is guided. We we know the equations that guide what we we can say. And in fact, in in a perfect world, if we had you know kind of a, a Laplacian demon thing going on, we could actually say what this machine is going to do just by tracking the microstates. You know where where mm -hmm. all the electrons are going. So so the thing is that uh, that perspective it's 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 not wrong in the sense that empirically yes we have equations that guide all these things, but. Would you would you hire that person for your new software company? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say you wouldn't because right. because right because anybody that doesn't believe that the algorithm is what makes the electrons dance is is it's it's not that they're factually wrong but but they're not gonna make anything new they're not if if they're not gonna write any new algorithms if they, if they don't if you don't fundamentally believe that there is such a thing as an algorithm that has causal power that determines what happens next you you can't participate in this whole stack of what happens afterwards. On the other hand, your traditional, um, uh, your traditional uh, uh, programmer is going to say, well, what I do is I write code that makes the computer do things. The code, the, the algorithm is in fact functionally uh, uh, potent. It makes the, 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 right? And so, and so that's a different lens. That's a different lens on it. And so what we're not going to do is argue about who's objectively right. We're just going to say that in different circumstances, you can gain different benefits from both from both views, and there is there's plenty of benefit to be gained from the kind of lens where you see what's going on in that in that microprocessor as a computation because you can write code and you can do other interesting things. It's it's a it's a view that steps away from prediction. As I mean, up, up until prediction is a real um uh, kind of uh, 
uh, a common thing that everybody latches onto. So, so you know, whether you're a reductionist or or not, the idea is, can you predict what the system is going to do next? And I that's that's fine. But I think something much more interesting than prediction. See, prediction is all good is 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 all good when somebody else has already set up the system for you. So somebody else mm. sets up the system, and now we're predicting. And now, can you predict it, or the, you know, who, who's got the better uh, right. the better way of predicting? But I think prediction is is just part of the story. What we're really interested in is maybe I, I don't know what a what a good word for it is. Um, maybe maybe it's pre invention or something. It's it's the idea that we're not just going to predict exactly what this clever system is going to do next. We actually need to be in a place to make one, and the next one, and the one after that. And so now. I'm interested in frameworks that facilitate that. I don't want to just be able to say, you know, somebody hands you a, a complicated thing and now here, here's how we know what it does next. I want to know how we get to the next one and what, what kind of worldviews and what kind of lenses uh, make it easier to uh, you know, facilitate invention, basically facilitate discovery. Mm. And so, and so that, that's how all this, all this fits together is, is this idea that uh, it really is a fundamental to being an observer to say, what is your interpretation? Uh, what is your lens through which you interpret a series of signals of events? And then what does that do for you? Gotcha. And I think, um, let's see, I'm just thinking from the paper, one, one of the things I pulled out that I thought was, I think it's in the abstract, the, um, the definition of the, one of the simpler, simplest definitions for poly computing is the ability of the same substrate to simultaneously compute different things. And you're saying it's, um, Via different, via different lenses, via different reference frames. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that definition, I mean, it's funny, that, that definition still really um, puts the, the center of gravity onto the, onto the, thing, onto the computing thing itself. Mm -hmm. And I want to I wanna sort of blow it out and say, yeah. that's, the, the, that's not where the magic is. The magic happens around it at the various observers that exist or could exist that will interpret what's going on in various ways. That's that's really a critical part of, of the whole thing. Gotcha. And I think it'd be really helpful if, um, could you provide a couple of examples? There's a great table in the paper that I'll probably overlay for part of the discussion, just so people can see it's about 20 different um, instances of computations, poly computations in the same biological hardware. But could you, I mean, maybe tell us like one or two of your favorite examples? Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, so 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 one, one example is, um, and this is uh, this is work that was done by a couple of postdocs in my group, uh, Sarama Biswas and um, uh, Wesley, Wesley Clausen. Uh, imagine uh, imagine a gene regulatory network model. So this is literally just a set of nodes. Maybe there's a dozen of them or so. Maybe a little more. Maybe a little less. Um, they all correspond to different genes or different proteins. And one of the things they can do is turn each other on and off. So you can imagine the sort of graph thing where each, each node has like a little arrow and it either upregulates or downregulates one of the others. And they're all sort of connected. And this is like network. Okay. So these things, these things are functional in every cell of, of the body. They work in, um, they're critical in evolution. They're critical in health and disease and embryonic development and so on. And so it's really important to understand what these, how, how these things function and what they do. And so if you look at it, uh, at, at, at these models, they look like a really um, kind of a paradigm case of a deterministic, simple mechanical thing. I mean, they're completely deterministic. There's no magic there. You can see exactly what, what's happening. Each one is, is up or down regulating some other. And there's a set of models to, to, to sort of model its behavior. There are ordinary differential equations, or some of these are Boolean uh, networks and so on. And so it looks really simple. And so if you were just to look at it, and you would say, well, how much intelligence does this thing have? you would say, well, that's a silly question. It's a clockwork. So what we're going to do, we're going to use, and so the traditional way of looking at these things is to use uh, the tools of uh, dynamical systems theory and to just treat this thing as a mechanical, uh, as a completely mechanical process. So that's one lens, and that's one way of looking at it. And so what that lens does is to say that if you want this thing to behave in a particular way, meaning let's say to go from disease state to, to a healthy state, you're going to have to rewire it somehow, meaning you might add nodes or subtract nodes or change the weights or something like that. You're going to interact with the hardware. And this is what modern molecular medicine does. It, it's, it's gene, it would be gene therapy. You would have to add new, new, you know, let's say if it was a gene regulatory network, you'd add a new gene that hits the promoter of some other gene, or you know, you'd change the promoters to be stronger or weak or something like that. So, so we took a we took a different approach. And again, this will this will come back with a vengeance when we look at the um, Tame paper, which is this idea that you actually don't know 
how in how intelligent and what the capabilities of this thing is uh, until you try. In other words, it's not the, the idea is that you 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 can't have these sort of philosophical feelings about where something is on that um, spectrum of uh, of cognition that we'll talk about. You actually have to do experiments. You have to state hypotheses and do experiments. And so 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 our hypothesis was this: we said um, let's let's test the idea that it has uh, learning capacity. And so the way you do so the way you do that is you basically treat it as if it were an entire animal, and you try to train it. In fact, um, uh, Charles Abramson and I wrote a uh, a paper on um, kind of uh, behaviorist approaches to studying novel creatures that you might use. You know, behaviorism is good for that because you don't have to make assumptions about what it is and and what it's made of and how it got here. You just there's just a set of behavioral strategies that you use to test to see what this thing can do. Mm -hmm. So. So what we did was was uh, imagine we took we chose three of the nodes, whatever we, we you know chose three of the nodes, and just for an example, there were many experiments, but here's just one. Mm -hmm. You 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 think of think of Pavlov's dog experiment, right? So in Pavlov's experiments, one of the things he did was uh, you ring a bell, which is normally a neutral stimulus for a dog, doesn't mean too much. Um, you present some uh, some food next to that uh, next to that stimulus, the dog salivates. Uh, you keep doing them together and the dog will eventually associate the sound of the bell with the presence of the food. And eventually you just ring the bell and the dog salivates. Okay. That's the standard, the standard story is actually somewhat different, but that's the standard story of it. So what we did is we decided, okay, could we, could we do this to the, to the network? And so what we would do is we would stimulate one of the nodes. That means, you know, upregulate one of the genes, um, do the same thing to another one that where normally the first one has no effect on whatever the response we're looking for is. So we choose one of the nodes as we call it our response. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's something that controls blood pressure, or maybe it's something that is some kind of enzyme, so something that we care about. And so that we, we choose a node that always turns that on. We choose some other node that's the neutral node, that's like the bell, which normally has no effect on it. And we just present them together. We present them together and then we pause and then we present them together and then we pause and then we present them together. So when you do this, what you find out is that uh, for certain for certain networks and for certain choices of the conditioned stimulus node, the unconditioned stimulus node and the response, it will actually learn to associate them so that later on when you present just the neutral stimulus, it fires off the response. Now that's amazing. That means that this 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 regular this gene regulatory network has associative learning capacity. It can be conditioned like a, like an animal can. Now, a couple of interesting things, uh, the, the reason I bring this up, one is that uh, random networks don't do this very much. Biological networks do this. So that means that evolution sort of uh, selects for this or, or the directly or indirectly, but the, but the you know, life, life likes this capacity. So that's one thing. Um, but another thing is that that choice of which of the nodes, so let's say you have a dozen nodes, so you can choose which of the nodes is going to be the, the conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus, and the response. That choice is not the only choice. You could pick three different nodes, or you could flip their roles around. And in fact, there's six different kinds of learning that it can do that, re that have different, you know, you can think about it as like a stencil, and you're sort of putting the stencil onto the, onto the network in different ways, and you're seeing different nodes in the roles that your stencil assigns. And so now you can do an experiment, and you can ask yourself, um, well, which of these different ways of looking at this network give me different capabilities. And so what you find is that for the exact same network, and so that's the key here, is that the learning capacity of this network was not due to uh, changes in the no, in the weights, you know, this the traditional idea of like synaptic connections, right? The weights yeah. are Nothing was changing. The hardware was never altered. It was exactly the same network. But depending on how I looked at it as an observer, I chose these three nodes, or I chose these three nodes, or these three nodes, depending on how I look at it, I can squeeze completely different functionality out of it. I can get it to do associative conditioning. I could get it to, uh, to do uh, sensitization or habituation or different other things. In fact, simultaneously, some of these memories can, can, can coexist. And so this, this to me is a really powerful example because what it means is that a single network, nothing was changed about that network, absolutely nothing. The, the hardware is exactly the same. And yet different observers can extract different utility from what it's doing, and of course, Josh's Josh's example uh, examples um, are are also very powerful in uh, in non living media. So th so this is this is the idea, right? Is that is that you change your perspective? You can you can improve what's going on by you, you, you know not not to not to sound like some kind of um, 
you know, a, a self-help uh, kind of thing. But but yeah. but literally, literally, right in the system, the improvement comes from changing your perspective on things, not by changing events. It comes from changing the way you look at those events, and so that that leads to a view of of evolution and and biology in general as this multi-scale soup of agents interpreting each other and finding better and better ways to interpret each other and understand each other and extract utility from that. And then, of course, the better you understand some system, the better you get at hacking it. And hacking, I don't mean the negative thing where, you know, you sort of abuse the, the, the system, although that certainly happens, right, with parasites and, and various other things that absolutely happens. But, but it doesn't have to be negative. The, the, the reason we have a body instead of a bag of amoebas is that these cells are constantly hacking each other. They are constantly sending out signals that get each other to do various things that they otherwise wouldn't do. It's behavior shaping all, you know, up and down the, 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 the scale hierarchy. So, 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 so that's the vision here, right? Is that, is that it's, it's just full of, it's a, it's a huge, you know, microcosm of observers interpreting each other and finding new, new and better ways to decode and interpret what they're getting from their neighbors, from, from the level above the level below and so on. Yeah, that's, Phenomenal that the same thing is being computed, but the way that it's being looked at changes the utility of that thing. It changes the usefulness of that computation. Yeah, it's incredible. And I think, I mean, I didn't know, I was unaware of this. I think that the average, the lay person probably has no idea <laughs> that uh, biological systems are doing this. And I'd say there's so many different places I could go from here. I guess, what are some of the, um, one of the things, one of the notes from, I think it's the first figure number two in the in the paper it's uh the spatial causal emergence graphs that you have um between determinism and degeneracy i know this is getting very much in the weeds but i'd love to just touch on it before maybe going back out to um to discuss some more of the the mechanical computing and the morphological computation as well i think it's a little bit later in the paper but for those spatial or causal emergences sort of this micro macro dynamic that's happening there. And this looks, the figure looks very familiar to, uh, similar to uh, some of Eric Howell's work. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if that was like brought in. Well, he Can was, you, he's, yeah, yeah, Eric was a, so, so Eric was a, um, uh, co-author on the on the first mm. uh, gene regulatory network paper. So if that's if that's the, if that's the if the figure you're the paper you're talking about, then he was he was a co-author on that. Yes. Oh, yes. I have the, I have the other paper. I don't think I have time for it today, but I did um, read that other paper you you, you co-authored with with him as well. So yeah, it is this. Um, and so, <laughs> the idea, if uh, you could probably explain this better, but the way I understand it is that uh, he has another paper called "When the Map Is Better Than the Territory." Yeah, how yeah. the macro scale can actually give you more information yeah, yeah, than just yeah. adding up all the micro scales. Can yeah. you perhaps, and I know it's, it's a very complex, that's a whole different divergence, but could you bring that into how it applies here? Because I wasn't quite able to make, I can sort of see the similarity or how it's related, but if you could yeah. expound on that, that'd be really helpful. Sure, sure. And, and you know, I'm not going to do a better job than Eric would about, yeah, yeah. Talking about sure. his own work, so you could have him on. But um, I, 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 th I think his work is uh, foundationally important. It's, it's, it's incredibly important work. And what he basically developed was a way to quantify and make rigorous a debate that's been going on for uh, probably thousands of years, which is, uh, are there any higher levels like bodies, uh, organisms, uh, he, you know, people, things like this? Or is it, or should it really be reduced to talking about molecules and atoms and whatever else is underneath? Right. I mean, people have been discussing that for a long time. And I, so, so he's found a way to quantify that. And his analysis shows that there are, and this is, of course, also the work of uh, Giulio Tononi and, and other people like that, um, uh, that with many others that have contributed to this since then, that uh, basically have figured out that for certain kinds of systems, you actually gain more power. Power means uh, better ways to control and predict the system. And, 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 and you gain uh, better, better predictive power by taking seriously these higher levels. And I'll give you, I'll give you just a, an, another simple example that I, that I um, uh, 
that I really like. There's this uh, there's this thing that uh, many of, of your uh, listeners will recognize. It's called the game of life. It's a cellular automaton. It's this uh, big grid, right? The universe is this giant grid, and it has a very simple physics. It has each each grid is a single um, node, and it can be either on or off. It's either bright or dark. And the, re the, the way you determine whether it's on and off is you count up how many neighbors it has that are on. And then there's a very simple, there's three simple rules that tell you whether that cell stays on or off. That's it. That's the physics. It's totally deterministic. There's nothing else in there. And so, and so the magic uh, that happens there is, uh, and this is uh, John Conway, um, I, I came up with this, is that if you, if you run that world forward from certain starting configurations, you see all kinds of amazing complexity emerge. And one of the things that you see is this thing called a glider. The thing about a glider is, is it's a stable pattern uh, that moves across the screen. Now, it, it, the, the, in, now, now let's keep in mind, in, the, in that uh, world, in, in life world, physics, there is no such thing as a glider. All that exists are individual, um, you can call them molecules or something that, that are just on or off, and they don't move, and that's it. There's no such thing as a glider. But to our visual system, we interpret a moving pattern of just imagine a wave of, 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 uh, of these cells turning on and off and on and off, right? So if they do that in a pattern, you see this thing moving along. So our mm -hmm. visual system is very good at, at turning those kinds of events into a mental representation of an object. It's not a real object in terms of physics. It's, a, it's, a, it's what you might call a persistent uh, physiological uh, kind of uh, state or a, you know, like a hurricane or something else that there are the molecules of air, yes, but then there's or or a wave or an ocean wave. You know, you got the water, but then you've also got this wave. Okay, so 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 one thing you could do is you could be a um, a, a strict uh, a kind of uh, reductionist about that world, and you can say, look, there are no gliders, and and I'll tell you why. You don't need to know about gliders in order to predict the next thing that's going to happen because the world is totally deterministic. And if you tell me where all the on so bits are at, at time t, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen into infinity. I just have to crank through the computation. I can tell you where everything's going to be. And this is true. However, what you don't have when you do this, if you don't believe in gliders, what you're not, yes, you can predict what happens after somebody else has set up a clever pattern for you. But what you're not going to do is invent a a, a, a touring a, a pattern in that uh, environment that creates a touring machine using gliders as a way to move bits around. Somebody did that. Somebody actually did that. They, they, oh, yeah. they right? They, they create, yeah, they, they created it. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. They, they created a computer inside of life world mm -hmm. and it uses these gliders to send signals around. That's the thing. It's not that the determinist, once you give them this amazing, uh, amazing setup, it's not that they can't tell you what happens next. They can, they just would never have made one because they don't believe in gliders because right and so and so this once again gets you back i know this is a little bit away from from what you asked about eric oh. but eric's work but i think but i think it's important it's the idea that yeah you can quantify prediction and control and it's it's very awesome that 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 his system gives you a way to to say that in certain systems knowing about these higher levels and looking at gliders as opposed to, and I don't know, I actually don't know if anybody's done this exactly for the game of life, but, but this, this kind of thing that, that, that knowing about these kind of higher levels, like for example, in biology, you might say knowing about organs as opposed to just the gene expression states or knowing about physio persistent physiological states, maybe stress states, maybe waves, maybe uh, calcium waves propagating through tissue, maybe electrical waves, whatever. Knowing about these things gives you extra power. But what we don't yet have a way of quantifying, and I think, you know, I've, I've been talking, I have a new postdoc coming that um, we, we've talked about uh, doing this project next, is actually trying to come up with, with, a, with a quantification of the next step, which is not just prediction, but actually the, the, the inventiveness part, the generative part. Mm. Like, right, what, 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 how much power does a certain lens give you to invent new stuff as opposed to just say what what pre-existing stuff is going to do next i think it's really important going to the future I mean, it's a super hard problem it's i i don't have yeah. a solution for it yet in my head but but i think it's really important and we don't we don't really have but i but i but i think that's the evolution that's the next evolution of the kind of thing that 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 eric did oh that's great thank you i never thought of a i mean it does even looking at the uh at the, at the figure here it does evoke the idea of the game of life a little bit because you have the transition probability matrix and everything like that but i never made the connection between say the micro rules and the macro um mm -hmm. objects that could be there gosh that's a whole we're going to talk about that the entire time but yeah that is um, a little bit more in his domain so to go back to i think the poly computing and i have just a couple more questions in this area before we move on around to, uh, act two 
Uh, if you could designate a little bit here, the differences between mechanical computing and morphological computation. Hmm. I don't know if it's familiar to you. The, you said that because one of the things I want to get into a little bit, and this could be the next part of our discussion, is um, some of the ideas that the paper brings up is around the brain-body dichotomy. And, you know, you kind of, this idea, I think, that's been prevalent in science, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that the brain is doing all the co computation, is doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah. But this, what I'm getting the vibe from this paper is that, no, it's far more complicated than that. It seems as though computation is happening at all these different levels. The brain is obviously a huge part of it, but uh, the body is doing a lot of work there. And it depends, of course, on what kind of lens you take, or what kind of framework you take. Um, so I know that's a lot, but would you fair... Uh, Feel free to unpack those concepts a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, you know, if if you want to dive deeply, specifically into morphological computation, um, Josh Bongard is the person I have on because he was actually a very important. He he did some very important work in this in this field, which ex exactly as you pointed out, it talks about um, the kinds of uh, computations that are done by the embodied. Uh, cognition of the controller. So, mm -hmm. so you know, and, and and there's some very interesting ideas in that field, like um, you know, instead of uh, instead of uh, for, for example, you might think, you know, do I need to evolve a controller to control a certain body, or uh, do I do I change the body to suit the to suit the controller? How do they relate to each other? Where is the actual intelligence? So there's many many things, and so he he could he could tell you all kinds of interesting stuff mm -hmm. there, but. Um, for, for me, what I, what I find interesting about it is this, again, let's, let's just back up and remember that what we're talking about when, when I say things like, um, you know, there's a, the organs in your body have intelligence, there's, there's a trivial sense of it. And this is what people often react to when they're, when they, when they object to this, these kind of statements is they will say, well, look, uh, you can just paint that onto anything. You can say anything is, you know, uh, uh, you know, here's here's a ball rolling down a hill and, you know, and, you know, and, and you can say, look at that. Isn't that amazing that it gets to where it's going? Boom, intelligent. So so that isn't what I'm saying. Uh, what the tame fr framework says is that in that that all intelligence claims are uh, engineering protocols, that when you tell me that some particular system has a degree of intelligence, what you really need to tell me is what's the problem space? What are, what are the goals that the system can achieve in that problem space? And what degree of sophistication can I assume that the system is going to have on its own without me micromanaging it? Those are the three mm -hmm. things that you are really telling me when you say, so if you tell me it's a bowling ball on a hill, what I hear is it has, it's, it's not zero competency. It actually has, by, 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 lead, by, by virtue of least action principles, it actually has a little bit of competency to minimize things like you know, kinetic and well, um, total energy and all that kind of stuff. So, so but, but I also know that if I want to change the way the ball rolls, I don't have any, I'm, I'm going to gain zero benefit by thinking about um, internal uh, state, you know, internal, uh, how, how does the ball feel about this landscape? That's not going to be a useful way for me to go. And the only tools I have are to modify the actual landscape. So I can put in bumps or I can push the ball or something, but you know, something like that. It, it does have a little competency in that I don't have to push it down the hill. It will find its way down. But, but really all I have is, is these kind of very low, very low agency ways to interact with it. On the other hand, if you tell me that what you have is a mouse on a hill, now, now we got a different story because now I know that, well, the tools I was going to use for that bowling ball, kind of useless. And what I really need to understand is what is the um, uh, behavioral landscape that the animal is seeing? What are the things that attract it? What are the things that repel or scare it? What are the things that it remembers about having been here before? In other words, when I want to change that system's behavior, I need to do a lot of thinking about uh, what are the internal states of, of, that, of that system and how it sees the landscape. It's not how I see the landscape that matters, it's how the system sees the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so and so that tells me uh, different ways that I can interact with it, right? And and different way I can change its beliefs. I can the, the very thing, you know, various things you can do. And sure. all the way up to all the way up to humans and, and so on. So that's that's you know, that that's the spectrum of co cognition that we'll talk about in the in the tame framework. So the idea there then is that when you say that the body is intelligent, what you're really saying is. Are there ways to interact with that aspect of it? And I and I really don't make that much of a distinction between brain and body. I think I think you know they're they're very tightly linked. Um, but the question is, do I treat this thing like a dumb clockwork, 
or am I better off assuming that it has certain autonomous capacities? Does it have memory? Does it have uh, homeostatic properties that I don't need to micromanage, right? The nice thing about your thermostat is that you don't have to push it all day long. You just set the set point and you leave it alone. And so, right, so, so what do I need to know about this? So, so that's, that's how I see all kinds of uh, intelligence and agency um, statements as, as engineering protocols. Gotcha. And one of the things that um, this paper reminds me a lot of, and are you familiar at all with uh, Jeff Hawkins' Thousand Brains Theory? A little bit. I mean, they, they're not expert in it, but Yeah, yeah, me, me neither. Yeah, I know this is like the bare bones of it. That, mm -hmm. um, but it reminds me of this like, quite a bit because yep. he, he claims that the brain builds all these different models of the world using reference frames. And so... It just, uh, I'm not sure if you have any comments about that or maybe how it might apply to this or if there's any link well, at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's very interesting and important. And I think that everything is great, except instead of the brain, you can put the uh, entire body, right? right. So, so mm -hmm. I, think, I think the whole body is doing this. There are, there are not that many things that your brain is doing that the whole body doesn't, that other parts of the body aren't doing in various spaces that are hard for us to access and see. But uh, yeah, I think I think that that kind of model is the right way to look at it. Gotcha. That's amazing. Uh, I have to look. I have to dive into that model <laughs> yeah. far more. But there was also a, a note. I'm trying to see. I can't quite find it in my notes here. But um, something about the the amount how it's there might be nothing in the universe. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But that has like a zero uh, oh, a degree yeah. of of zero. Um, I don't know, causal influence or some kind of computation. Could you unpack that a little bit? It's something that you even you mentioned clearly that there's this might even this idea might make people uncomfortable. Even sure, uh, sure. what are some of the possible implications of it? Yeah, yeah. Well, many many of these uh, ideas uh, make make people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I'll just uh, barrel on, I guess. Um, um, uh, so 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 one of the one of the key things about the Tame framework, which really started in that in that um, uh, cognitive light cone model, is that we want to be able to have the same, first, first of all, we want to be able to say that um, agency, uh, cognition, computation uh, oh, the, of, the, the, of the type that we're talking about uh, is not binary, okay? That it's a, it's a spectrum, it's a continuum. So, so we want to be able to define that continuum. And, and if you're gonna, uh, and, and, and the goal is to define a continuum and I call it in that paper, I call it a continuum of persuadability, and then that's on purpose. Again, it's because the reason is that I'm not talking about, um, uh, I'm not trying to uh, pin it on, on a uh, kind of a single universal objective fact about the system. I'm looking at it from the perspective of an observer who wants to relate to it somehow, to, in, to understand it, to, to um, change how it works, to get it to do something, to uh, manipulate it somehow, uh, to make a new one, you know, whatever. That, but it's a very, that's why TAME stands for technological approach to mind everywhere. The technological aspect is, it's, it's, we're not arguing philosophy here. We are trying to get to very uh, specific and testable ways in which other, other beings, you know, observers, and they could be scientists like us, they could be um, biologicals, uh, they could be parasites, they could be conspecifics, it could be the entire evolutionary process, all, all of those are observers, uh, are able to optimally interact with that system. So, so if you have this spectrum, and so, you know, so, so for now, on the right side of the spectrum are some, some, some humans, let's say, and going down, you know, you, you, you see all sorts of things, you know, systems with which you can inter interact through so, so with the humans, you can actually give them reasons and they will go and do things autonomously, right? And you don't have to micromanage the how or the when or the what. You just give them a, a reason and they will pick a goal and, and sort of run with it. So lots of autonomy, like huge agency, like, you know, lots right. of autonomous uh, activity. And so, so, so down past that, you have some other, some other creatures like certain animals that you can train in various ways. And so you can give them a goal and they will, uh, with various degrees of ingenuity, they will, they will be able to, um, uh, to achieve that goal and so on. And you can sort of keep going down and down and so so with any and and that's that's a slide that that you could uh, at some point if you want to do screen sharing you, you could show that but um which which slide is that well it's it might be figure one it might be from the tame paper it might be oh. the i don't remember at this point but it might be the uh uh the one of the first figures on the spectrum of persuadability and and you know and again it's all it's all about engineering protocols it's all if you want to persuade that system to do something 
how do you do it? Do you do it the way you would with a mechanical clock by rewiring the hardware? Do you do it like you would with a thermostat by changing the set point? Do you do it the way you would with a with a dog or a horse by giving it um, a rewards and punishments for specific behaviors? Or do you do it like with a human by by giving them actual cogent reasons for them to do things? So 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 I so you construct this kind of and I, and of course I'm not the first person to try for this kind of um, uh, uh, spectrum of you know Wiener and Rosenbluth and Bigelow did this in like 40, 1943 they tried for one and 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 before that uh, William James uh, talked about this kind of thing before that so so the thing about those kinds of spectra is that the natural question is well where's the bottom of it. So is there a bottom of it? And if there is, I mean, most people assume that there is, and most people put the put it put it pretty to, to, to me quite quite far up the thing. Actually, you know, people talk about people have have concerns about plant, um, you know, plant agency and and uh, and insects and things like this, which I think is just you know, I think those are things so so far off from where the if there is a zero, they're so far off from the zero that it's uh, you know it's completely wrong. But um, but do you mean they're so far close to zero? No, 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 no. Oh, I mean, the zero above. should be the zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, we have okay. so many things, so many interesting things to worry about uh, that are mm -hmm. really minimal compared to that. The plants and other things are like, I mean, to me, of course, of course, they're on the spectrum. So, mm -hmm. so, but, but the question is, uh, is there a zero? And, and if there is a zero, what does it look like? And so I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a super firm conclusion on this, but I tend to think the answer is no, that there is no zero. And I'll tell you why. Um, Let's imagine for a moment, and, and this is an exercise I recommend to everybody and anybody who thinks that, uh, well, of course I have it, whatever it is, you know, it's a co cognition. I have true, I have true agency, whatever that is, I, I've got it. And, uh, you know, definitely um, this, this rock here doesn't, or a cell, let's say doesn't, or, a, you know, an unfertilized oocyte, which all of us were at one point, doesn't. So, so the exercise that you need to go through is what is the most minimal version that had it and, and, and what happened right before that? So, so you've got it and you sort of roll yourself back to however old you are and then nine months back slowly, but surely, and guess what? You're an unfertilized oocyte. So at one point, at some point it showed up. And if you really think there's a sharp zero or non-zero, you have to say where it showed up. And of course, developmental biology offers absolutely no place where you can say, ah, that's it. That's it right there. That, that's mm -hmm. where it's and so, and so that's a problem. And so, and so I, I suggest everybody to do this experiment and to say, what is the absolute minimal version of, of agency that you think uh, it would take to get on the spectrum? And, you know, and, and people will often say, well, it's a, it's a cell. And, and I'll say, yeah, well, what if it's just slightly simpler than the cell? I mean, surely that's fine too. And I say, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. So, so go all the way to the bottom, uh, you know, to figure out what you think is the absolute minimum. So when I think about the absolute minimum, I want it to have two features. The first feature I want it to have, any system that's on that spectrum, the first feature I want it to have is some degree of goal-directed uh, behavior. Goal-directed behavior means that it uh, tends to achieve a particular outcome in some kind of uh, uh, state space. And if it is deviated from that, it will expend some minimal degree of capacity to still get there. Okay. Hmm. And so, 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 we, in, and, and so, so, that's, so that's the first thing, some kind of goal-directed activity. And the second thing, I would expect some minimal degree of indeterminacy. In other words, the behavior of this thing is not well described by knowing exactly what's happening to it right now. In other words, and in, in you know, in the in the local microenvironment, all the pushes and pulls that are happening right now are not perfectly sufficient to explain what's going to happen. Meaning that the distance between it and the causes that control it I have some depth to it. It's not just something that you know. However, you push it, that's how it acts. There's something else. That controls you. You can't you can't derive it from the local environment. Okay, and so this could be memory. It could be predictive capacity that it has. Whatever. So as we think about those two minimal things, we realize that even even elementary particles have this because the first part, the goal directed activity, is taken care of by by least action principles in physics. Mm -hmm. So they have the ability to minimize and maximize certain quantities. Um, and and I, I'm no physicist, but but somebody like Chris Fields and, and Carl Friston and so on have a much more sophisticated story about this. I'm, I'm telling you a very, very simple version that basically all the way baked in at the very bottom of physics are these variational principles where you can already see that 
certain systems have non-zero uh, capability to get to the same uh, to get to the same goal. And again, it's like um, you know, th think of think of uh, think of a rock or a roller coaster. If I'm an engineer, the reason that it's not zero, the reason that 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 it, that, that it isn't is a zero on that spectrum is if I'm an engineer. I have to spend a lot of time working on how I'm going to get this thing up the up the roller coaster hill, but I don't have to worry about how it gets down. I don't have to push it down. It, it, it that isn't much compared to our the, the you know human agents. You say, "Wow, that's a rock." You know, that's that's a roller coaster rolling down the thing. I mean, that's that's minuscule. Like, right? We were looking for the minimal version. We weren't looking for a nice, rich version of agency that humans have or that other animals have. We were looking for the minimum. The minimum is. What can I depend on this thing to do on its own? What preferences does it have on its own? And this is this is a super old idea. Giordano Bruno used to say stuff like this. This is this is very old. Um, that that it isn't zero. The competency of these things is not zero. It's very low, but it isn't zero. And and the thing about the indeterminacy, we of course we have that in the quantum realm too, because we have lots of uh, events that are not directly determined by what happens now. So out of those two ingredients now. You can imagine two ways to go from that as also super minimal, but it would have to be minimal because that's what we start out looking for. Of course, it doesn't look like human agency or 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 even you know yeah. big brain agency because we started out looking for the minimal versions. So now two things can happen there. One is you can aggregate those things in a very dumb fashion that doesn't increase the depth of it. And that means taking a bunch of particles and making a big rock out of them. When you do that, you have not increased the agency at all beyond the, the, the very minimum that the that the individual particles had. You, you they, it still has equally the same very minimal. But there are other ways to aggregate them, which actually amplify what's going on here. And the systems that do that, that's what we call life. That's that's what when 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 people you know I, I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to come up with a definition for life, but 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 that's what I think life really refers to. Life, what we call life is any system that is really good at scaling these fundamentally non-zero competencies of chemistry and physics into much larger competencies, larger cognitive light cones, novel problem spaces, and things that we begin to recognize as being on the spectrum. So that's what life is good at, is scaling. And so I once asked Chris, um, if, uh, if it, given all of that, I said, I said, is it possible to have a universe with no least action principles? So basically, could we, could we, I, you know, our world doesn't, to, to me, our world doesn't have zero, um, zero agency anywhere. But, but the question is, could, could, could there be one? Could there be a universe that, that had literally zero? And uh, Chris said that the only way to do that is to have a universe where nothing ever happens, a static world where nothing changes. Because uh, and and I, you know, I'm I'm not going to um, go down that rabbit hole here, but but he could tell you a whole story about uh, the the kind of uh, uh, active inference like process that happens in any interaction between any two things in the world. They don't have to be brains. They don't have to be alive. That that minimal interaction between object object in the environment and what makes for a permanent object and all these kinds of things, all of that is baked in at the very bottom level of of physics. Life is just good at scaling it up. Hmm, that's incredible. Huh. I would love to, I actually spoke with uh, Carl Friston a couple weeks ago. I interviewed him and talked cool. about the free energy principle and was very confused for most of it, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I did a lot of research going, I mean, it, I hadn't heard the term before, but it has a high research load and that yeah, requires, yeah. you know, information for all these different disciplines and it was incredible yeah. and uh, such a treat to talk to him directly. So I have sort of this, um, Related to that, one thing you just said, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you said our, our world doesn't have zero agency anywhere. Is that your belief? I, think, I mean, yeah. yeah, I think at this point I would say that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh. yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, yeah, I think that's true. Somebody else, I just came across somebody else's uh, quote. Uh, was it Robert Rosen? I, f I forget whose quote it was, unfortunately, but, but some, somebody said that, you know, that, that, that the thing we think of as true inanimacy is the exception not the rule that 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 the you know that that really it's uh and and i and i would take it further i i'm at this point i'm not aware of anything that i would say is truly zero but again let's let's make sure we understand this is a rigorous uh position that has to do with as an engineer what can i take advantage of mm. right and and there is nothing at, to my knowledge where uh, those tools that come, right? So, so again, the thing, the thing about that spectrum is what, what changes as you go from left to right across that spectrum 
are the toolkits that you need to interact with that system. Right, the things that are useful for the mechanical clock become less useful as the system progresses, and 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 vice versa. And con conversely, things that are useful for for human subjects become less and less useful as you go down the down the road. So this isn't the kind of um, uh, kind of uh, lo loosey goosey uh, sort of talk where you say everything is uh, you know everything is alive. Yeah. Every I mean, you can do that, but that's but that's that's pretty useless. Okay, that doesn't advance you at all. What I'm talking about is a very specific. Uh, way to 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 drive research agendas, which mm -hmm. is to take tools that are useful in one field for dealing with one kind of system and ask what other kinds of systems are these tools useful for? And to not be able to, I mean, I'm, I'm arguing against having these sort of armchair uh, philosophical um, preconceptions about what things have to be. Somebody, somebody said to me once, um, we were talking about this thing and I was, somebody said, well, 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 surely you don't think the weather has any intelligence to it. And being perfectly serious, uh, I said, has anybody tried training the weather? I, I, I honestly don't. This is an empirical question. You and I cannot decide whether weather patterns, meaning patterns of air movement in the atmosphere, do or do not exhibit habituation, sensitization, associative conditioning of some sort. You and I sitting here in our chairs are not going to be able to decide that. And, and, and a lot of people don't, don't think that's the way to do it because they feel that if the empirical, um, you know, if, if, if those kind of empirical things uh, are, are, are the prediction of your worldview, then, you, then, you're, then, then, the, then the worldview must be wrong. They, you know, they sort of assume that mm. any worldview that, that, that can possibly tell you that, you know, the, that the, the weather, weather pattern is, has, has certain problem solving capacities is obviously wrong because because you that you're already you know you're, you're starting with with something that's wrong I, I think that's completely upside down philosophically i don't think you can do it that way i think you have to say uh see see what see what the see we see what the empirical results are and then you'll know how good your 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 outlook was was it was it was it helping you or not i don't think we, you and i can't decide this about these systems so i i actually think that massive um opportunities exist for looking for the surprising and and we, we have some we have some pretty cool stuff coming out on this um soon um uh, in the next few months uh, that's not peer reviewed yet so I don't, I don't really want to talk about it but there sure. there'll be some once it's once it's uh, peer reviewed you'll see the 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 project of looking for these kinds of um cryptic capabilities and systems that we normally are no good at recognizing as having uh, these kind of capacities i think there's massive opportunities for this we, we, we don't we don't realize we are we are so bad at it we do not realize how much intelligence is uh, is is all around us and and I said I said um, uh, there was a there was a tweet a few weeks ago where I said something like this that you know one of the things I love about AI is that it's it's like a lens or a, or a translation device that's going to help us see a lot of the intelligence that's all around us all the time it's like being able to suddenly being able to communicate with an intelligence with a parallel set of intelligence that they were here all along we just never knew we never knew how to recognize them we never knew how to relate to them and so and so, so you know some people liked it and some people just said that was the craziest thing they'd ever heard but uh and that that's you know that that's not the right way to think about it but i really i really think that um so far when we've looked for these things in a in a rigorous way not the way where you say you know every rock has a spirit behind it i mean okay but but does that help you right maybe if you mm. can give me a, an engineering protocol what's the yeah. interface right what's the interface to that spirit and so so that that's not super useful but some of these other things taking uh tools from cognitive and behavioral sciences from from the kinds of things that carl and, and chris are doing that is 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 super rich it drives all kinds of new research agendas so so that's why i stand behind that statement wow mike you're blowing my mind this is awesome i can't wait to see some of that research coming out later later this year hopefully the um <laughs> i could go in so many different directions off of that um i think next oh, wow uh Huh. One of the things I would love to to cover uh, that's in the TAME paper, and there's so many different, and I'll, I'll link in the description for folks watching this. Uh, please go go through uh, Mike's papers and and take a look for yourself because there's so so much rich information in them. One thing that I think might help a little bit to bring a couple of these concepts together, and I think one of my favorite um, images from it is the one where you break out homeostatic loops between mm. gap junctions. Mm. And then you also have, I mean, everything's on this. You have the planaria, 
that are uh, you know ranges of uh, I think microvolts, and then the free energy or landscape that's there as well. And the idea, I believe that's a, like a tractor landscapes, right? That's the um, differences there. Can you give us a, a sense of how these things work together? And I think this is also applied to say morphological space as well, right? It's, it's that's yeah, all, yeah, all related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but can you provide us uh, with an idea, I guess for specifically for like more of a lay audience, even for myself, a lot of the stuff I'm sort of circling around, circumambulating these ideas, and they're kind of slowly starting to congeal for me in terms of my understanding. But it'd be really helpful if you could provide us with um, like an example or an intuition around how this stuff all comes together. So you have the, the landscape, you have the attractors, um, and is this stuff, should we think of these attractor landscapes metaphorically? I mean, is this, is this just a useful uh, visual for us to help us understand or is this really what's this is like the most real we can get yeah that's a, yeah that's a that's a very uh, very deep philosophical question so so i i'm i'm going to um uh i'm i'm, I'm going to approach it this way um let's 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 uh, back up for a moment and just just realize that uh people okay people people sometimes ask me um you know they people say uh what if uh what what if we're just living in a simulation you know what if what if reality is okay i i, I don't know what the alternative is of course we're living in a simulation there is no mm -hmm. alternative to that because we are constructed in a way that has uh certain kinds of sensors it we are our mind and our body build uh, maps of the external world and of ourselves we have internal models of ourselves that are inferred from the from the signals that we get we do not have access to reality it's right. it is guaranteed that you live in a simulation there's no question about it because because we do not have access to to reality not only and you know and, and many people have said this before and you can talk to don hoffman and, and folks like that but 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 the idea is that um not only do we see a tiny fraction of the spectrum of, uh, you know, in terms of our senses, right, we, we only see a tiny fraction of the information that comes through. So we're completely as individuals we are completely ignorant of the rest of it. But, um, but also, uh, we are that that philosophical brain in a vat, you know, that that from from Phil, philosophy 101, where they say, you know, what if you're a brain in a vat, and, and, and just, you know, all these sensory images are coming at you. I mean, th that, that is literally what we are. And then we have we have we have a model of our body, and we have a model of the outside world. And, you know, we don't, we, we don't feel the same, the same way you don't feel like there's a, um, there's a blind spot in your retina, you're just used to it. We also don't feel like there's a huge blind spot in the x ray spectrum. Oh, my God, how come I can't see x rays, you don't feel it, you're used to this limited reality. And one of the one of the things that leads to is that Think, think about our, our major sensors and effectors, okay? So our major sense, uh, sense organ is um, uh, uh, things like uh, smell and taste and vision, of course. All of that point and touch, all of that points outwards. I mean, we have pain and things like that, but, but, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of them point outwards. And our effectors, meaning muscles, move us through three-dimensional physical space. So what we are really good at is visualizing a, th a, a three-dimensional space that we think we live in, and we recognize other minds, other agents, by which are medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds in this three-dimensional space. That is what we're good at recognizing. That is just an evolutionary mm, uh, uh, consequence of the way we're built. What we are really not good at doing is recognizing unconventional agents, meaning very large ones, very small ones, very fast ones, very slow ones. We are not good at recognizing unconventional agents in novel problem spaces. So what is a, what is a problem space? So imagine for a moment if, um, if we had an internal, uh, and, and I think we can build, uh, you know, this is on our list is to build a, a, a creature like this, but, but I think, I think we could, we, you, you could imagine a being that had an internal sense that was, for example, sensing your blood chemistry all the time. Let's say it was measuring, let's say, you know, like with a, with a tongue or something like this, you could, you could measure um, uh, 10, 10 different uh, aspects of your blood chemistry. You, if if we had the ability to to measure that and and to, the way that to 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 sense that the way that we sense with vision, you would know that your body lives in this ten dimensional option space 
right? Where just like we live in a three-dimensional space, if you could sense 10 different things, you would, your, your, about your blood, your blood would be in this physiological state space that would have 10 dimensions to it. Of course, we can't visualize that, but we would, if we had evolved that way, we would be able to. Um, and you would also know that there are these things called liver, kidneys, and so on, that are really clever about navigating that space that when they get perturbed by specific things that happen in terms of your blood chemistry, they can find ways around it. They keep you alive despite all sorts of, you know, terrible things that you do to them with, you, you know, with your lifestyle and all that. Um, we would have no problem recognizing them as beings that live in this space. We would know we live in this space. We just don't, we just, we, we're very bad at recognize this, recognizing this. And, and it is no less real than the large scale three-dimensional space in which we navigate with our muscles. We are constantly navigating physiological state space, which has way more than 10 dimensions. Of course, we are navigating transcriptional state space, so gene expression space. So if you have, you know, I don't know, several tens of thousands of genes as an organism, that is a very high dimensional space that you are walking in all the time by turning different genes on and off. You're navigating that space. We have metabolic spaces. Uh, we, you know, we now modern humans have linguistic spaces and who knows what else, what else is out there. So, um, so, so for sure, uh, with all of these things are as real. Uh, they're, they're, they're super real. Why? Because if you didn't have ways of navigating them, you'd be dead. That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate way of knowing whether something is real or not, which is, can I afford to ignore it? That, that's it. It's again, and I'm taking, I'm once again, taking a very technological engineering approach to this. I mean, saying that um, things are real to the extent that you need to pay attention to them. And they may be things you can hold in your hand and they may not be, but to the extent that you will you you suffer by not paying attention to them, that's what tells you if they're real or not. And so you for sure now it's not under your conscious control. Most of the, most of these things are not under your conscious control. Right. But nevertheless, you've got apparatus in your body that constantly is is moving around in these other spaces, and you better believe your body's good at doing that and takes those things very seriously. Otherwise, we, we'd be dead. And so, and so, so that's kind of the starting point for this idea of diverse intelligence which is that we really need to get better at recognizing uh, different degrees of, of beings, the different um, uh, unconventional minds that live in these other spaces. And that includes our organs and various cells and various smart implants as we develop them and, and, and so on. That's interesting. And the, I guess, how does the, how do the attractor landscapes fit into that? Oh, the attractor, yes, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry, I forgot about the- uh, what That's the, okay, the it's a big question. I mean, there's a lot of different things. <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of different, yeah. So, so you can imagine any of these spaces, they have a topography, right? They have, they're not all flat and um, they have a topography with respect to which states are next to which other states, like right? which are adjacent, can you get from here to there? Um, how much barrier is it? How much energy do I have to, uh, put in to get from here to there. You know, if if lo low potassium is over here, high potassium is over here, sodium is here, you know, chloride is here, and there's you know how many other dimensions. How much energy do I need to use to move from here to there? Meaning to crank up my my potassium state from here to there. So so there's this there are these barriers uh, of all different shapes and sizes, and navigating that landscape, um, you have some ability to um to know where you are and where you're going. So for example, uh, one of these spaces is anatomical morphous space. So I'll give you a very simple example and then we'll, we'll, we'll do a more realistic thing. So, sure. so one of the first, um, well, uh, the, one of the first people to talk about morphous spaces was Darcy Thompson, who in his book has some uh, on growth and form has, has some super amazing and, and prescient uh, 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 images in there, which I still, I think people still haven't, um, uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, utilized to their full, yeah. full in, in do you port. recall, do you recall what the book's called? Yeah. It's called on growth and form. It's very famous. It's a 1940s book. I mean, most biologists know it, but, but few people really pay attention nowadays, but there's a couple of, there are a couple of things in there, which I think are, are super profound, um, which is, which is specifically that, that he shows, um, he draws, he draws these, uh, uh, grid grids and then superimpose a creature onto that grid, let's say a fish. And then you apply a mathematical deformation to that grid and you get a very different looking fish. Oh, that's yeah. actually another fish, right? right. So, and anyway, so, so, so um, a classic explanation of morphous spaces comes from a paper by, by this guy named Raup. And uh, what he envisions is, is uh, seashells and snail shells of all kinds. And the thing is that there's only, there's only a few, two or three parameters that can be used to describe any 
call, coiled mollusk shell, you know, because you got big, big flat ones and the pointy ones and everything in between. So there's only a few, there's a, there's a mathematical formula that generates the, the spiral and there's only a few parameters in it. And so what you can imagine is this, this virtual space. So let's say, let's say just for, for, for fun, let's say there's three parameters. So, you know, A, B, and C. And so you can imagine this is the A dimension, this is the B dimension, this is the C dimension. And so every possible shell is somewhere in that space because it's defined by a point that has those values of A, B, and C. So every, every possible shell is somewhere here. So now there are regions of the space. There are regions, and he actually, in his paper, he actually draws this out. There are regions that correspond to this set of species. And there are regions that correspond to no set of species, because apparently those kind of shells wouldn't be very good in the real world, but they're possible. And so he talks about different, he talks about the um, geography of the space. Here are the actual ones. Here are the possible, but not the uh, current. Here are the ones that are impossible given biological development. And here are the ones that are, you know, possible, but really not adaptive and so on, right? In a different region. So, so that space, so, so now think about um, anatomical morphous space. For the, for, the, for the rest of us, there are a very high number of parameters that determine all of the possible anatomical configurations that you might take. So your eyes might be, you know, closer or further together. Your, your head might be different shapes, of, you know, and, and people, um, Obzanov uh, uh, and, and, and other people have studied this in bird beaks and, and various things. Uh, the point is that all of these morphological spaces have attractors. Attractors are regions in that space which are easy to slide down into that once you sort of come close, um, you don't have to do a lot of work to end up down there. And once you're down there, it's harder to climb up. So this kind of keeps, you know, it, 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 um, so, so, so different species, for example, different shape planaria heads. So we work with these flatworms, these planaria, different shape heads correspond to, and that's the figure that you're talking about, correspond to different attractors in that space because all things uh, being equal, plus or minus various to, um, environmental influences, you still, you know, the, the, typically the acorn ends up in the oak tree attractor and the, 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 you know, the frog egg ends up in the froggy attractor. Not always, because we can push it into the xenobot attractor, but that's a different, that's, oh, right, a, that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a different, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, even for the oak tree, this is, you know, kind of my latest thing that I, I point out to everybody. Uh, if, if, under normal circumstances, acorns are really good at making flat green leaves, right? Oak leaves. But actually, if you hack it the right way, there are wasp parasites that send certain signals to those cells that create galls that are these amazing uh, spherical red spiky things that don't look anything like flat green leaves. And that tells you that with the right prompting, um, uh, you can hack these kind of competent systems into finding other attractors in morphospace space that they normally never go to. And you can push them into that space. And, and that space contains xenobots and various galls and who knows what the heck else it contains. Mm. And, so, and so those attractors are things that, that evolution has, has uh, selected to, uh, to utilize in the normal standard version of what happens. And then we can do interesting things like in planaria, we can uh, drive them into other attractors that belong to the wrong species. And that doesn't require changing the DNA. That requires just... Uh, changing the electrical decision making that happens during the regeneration process, and they end up in as, as other with with heads of other species. Yes, and that reminds me. I'm not sure if it's in this paper or maybe it was something else that you had discussed on a podcast, but mm -hmm. the um, it was something related to yes, and manipulating it slightly, but not the genes. I mean, just um, the bioelectricity lighter, uh, the forms that it would take was more or less like the probability of its ancestral, yeah. of its evolutionary uh, cousins, let's say, the closest yeah. evolutionary. So it kind of goes back. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, good. that just means that's just, okay, so 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 we don't have, you know, the, the technology for um, uh, controlling that bioelectrical interface is still in its infancy. We have, we have uh, fairly limited control over the richness of that bioelectric interface. And so what that means is that in the planaria case, we can't really choose specifically which head shape it'll get. What we do, what we can do is we can disorient it to the point where it'll do something other than its normal situation. And that's not the case mm -hmm. in these other systems. We have lots more control in others' cases, but particularly in this, in this specific case, we can't really drive it to one or the other attractor. So it's stochastic. It's, you, you do it to 100 embryo, uh, to 100 uh, flatworms, sure. and you find out that you know, 30 of them make this kind of head, the triangular head, and, and you know, 25 of them make a square head and, and whatever. Right? So there's, there's a spread of probabilities because we don't have fine enough control yet in planaria to, to to, uh, to, to, to have exactly the head shape that you want. So, so what my student, um, and this was uh, Maya Emmons-Bell who did this work, what she, uh, she was an undergrad, by the way, uh, in the lab, you know, she's kind of amazing. 
um, the work that uh, that she did just showed that the uh, probability of ending up with one of these other species heads, so round and flat and triangle and whatnot, the probability of getting one of these heads was proportional to the evolutionary distance between the species. So it's 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 basically it's rarer that you find that you end up in the attractor of an evolutionarily more distant form. So that kind of makes sense. If all you're doing is so imagine you're a, you're a, you're an autonomous yeah. vehicle and you're trying to make your way home. And now somebody like me comes along and messes up with the bioelectric uh, interface that determines where you're driving to. You're much more like if you're going to make a mistake, you're less likely statistically to make a mistake and end up very far away than you are to make a mistake and end up at a closer attractor. And mm. so, so what that suggests is so, so that all makes makes perfect sense. It suggests that evolution uses the same uh, tweaks the same control knobs as we were tweaking, meaning this bioelectrical interface. And that means that yeah, that yeah, the ones that the ones that evolution uh, that took the longest for it to accomplish are the ones that are further in morphous space, because because you have to make more tweaks to have that that vehicle end up in that in that location. Yeah, yeah, and I think I'm not sure which paper was from, but there's a great visual of um, it's like um, these circles encompassing one another, a molecule organelle all the way up to biosphere, and then you have the morphous examples of from metabolic all the way up to behavioral and evolutionary time and i think that's a great way i mean when i see something like this and just keep on thinking about the importance of oh sure um the attractor landscapes and then i also think that there's and this is really speculative obviously but the uh when i think of these and obviously the, the visuals make make these things potent things like uh quantum fields and the excitations of particles within that those fields or something things like you know you say like you, the attractor it's like you get close to that space and then you fall into it i think of black holes and i'm thinking okay what is going on here what are the is there um and obviously i mean but informed by your research and your experience is there some kind of are there, are there, and they, I mean, this going back to say the game of life as well, do you have an intuition as to what perhaps like the fundamental rule or rules are that, I mean, that was, that was a lot to cover. <laughs> you don't have to touch all, like all those different places, but um, can you infer what, uh, what would be something like an ultimate rule or set of rules? Uh, so you, want, you want the secret of uh, the universe? Is, is oh what, yeah, what pretty much. About. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. In yeah. two minutes, I right, have to run. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why, why not? Um, no, no. Of course, I, I, I have no idea. And uh, the, the, you know, the w one thing we need to be humble about, and I think this uh, fits with the whole poly computing observer focused view here, is that um, w w when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we we have these we have these ideas. So so I lean very heavily on concepts of navigation and 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 you know spaces and geometry and topology and all of this stuff. I, not because I know that this is the best frame. This is these are the tools that we have, and so we can push the ball forward a little further than than prior work, which didn't use those tools. That's fine. But that's not to say that these are the, this is the best way to think about this. Entirely possible, you know. I mean, I mean, Don Hoffman and and other physicists tell us that space time is doomed, and that the, the, you know there's a completely different way of thinking. Okay, I can't even wrap my mind around some of that stuff, so, so I don't know. But but I'm totally open to the idea that this is everything that I've given you is just the best current frame that I can come up with. So it might be from for the so so what what I'm saying is the reason that all these things look, sound similar, you know, with the black holes and and all of that, maybe because that's the tools that we've been those are the tools we've been using. I don't know if that will hold up or or conversely, maybe we underestimate the 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 multi scale nature of things where yeah it'll turn out that yes it is all the same math. I, I have no idea. This is this is just the best you know the the the, the best frame. All, all all I'm pretty sure of actually is that we really have to um, commit to the fact that uh, everything is observer relative and that uh, you cannot make decisions about the agency of systems sitting in an armchair and making assumptions, that you have to test out different lenses and you have to ask, how is that, how is that working for you with that, with that lens? And, 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 and to see how much, well, you know, how much uh, um, 
uh, uh, facilitation of research uh, that that does feed and, and understanding and 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 by the way in a, I, in the last you know sort of two two minutes I'll I'll, I'll say this that 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 team paper with a spectrum of persuadability it was very focused because I think it's important to push people in that direction very focused on an engineering approach to modifying and uh, uh, controlling systems and engineering new systems. Okay, that's all great. But as you head towards, I mean, I think it's very important and, and I'm writing stuff about this that'll come out at some point. As you get, the further you get to the right side of that spectrum, you have to shift over from ideas of, of control to ideas of relationship. And this is where a lot of the um, you know uh, ethics aspects come in, because because our system is of ethics, we have we we're going to need new system of systems of ethics that really take seriously the existence of unconventional minds that are not just built on ancient um, and really uh, just very childish uh, notions of uh, how you separate things you have to care about from things that you don't need to care about. You know, where were they were they engineered versus were they naturally evolved? Do they have a big brain? None of these criteria are going to survive the next decades. This is all all this stuff has to go. And, and new new uh, systems of ethics has to come because all of this is really about how do you relate to others, other systems? How do you relate to things that look like you, to things that look nothing like you, things that don't share the same evolutionary tree with you? Uh, and, and, and in some cases, that relationship means control in the way that we do with, with clocks and, and, and your thermostats. And in other cases, it, it, it takes a completely different form with with various beings, unconventional beings, possible aliens, possible um, AIs, uh, whatever, uh, that where that relationship is going to be quite different, where 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 you benefit from their agency, you don't try to you know sort of micromanage it. That that's the lesson I think from all of this. Yeah, that's wonderful. And thank you. I know I have to let you go because you have a commitment now. But we didn't get time to talk about biology, Buddhism, and AI. Unfortunately, oh, man. always over promise. Yeah, yeah. Next time, if you're if you're willing, yeah, I'd love sure, to, uh, sure, sure. to sure, chat I'll again. I really appreciate that, Mike. And thank you so much for your time today. No problem. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Nice conversation. Thank you.